Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stuff I'm Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio. And it is Thursday, as this is first released, which means it is time for another happy hour slash kind of unhappy hour. Uh, <laughs> an open space. An open, an open space, space for discussion. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yes. And with that being said, a rare trigger warning in these um, brief mentions of sexual trauma and eating disorders. Very, very brief. But just want to put that in there. Also, as always, drink responsibly if you choose to do so. We would love for you to join us and just take a moment to relax, however that means to you. Yes. So, Samantha, what yes. are you sipping on? You know what? I'm keeping it easy. I got a truly mm-hmm. hard lemonade. I love their lemonades. I don't know. It just feels so like refreshing, especially mm-hmm. during the hot weather and y'all it's hot and I have my air conditioning off and it's Atlanta and it's humid, so gross. But I don't like the regular lemonade, so I've had to like sparkle it up with some flavoring. I put some little bit of raspberry flavor, so it's raspberry lemonade. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. So I'm keeping it chill. Very, you very chill You fancied it up, though. <laughs> you know, I did. I like, I like to make fancy. Yeah. What about you? I kind of fancied it up, too. I made... Oh, I can't remember the name of this cocktail. It's a very basic one. But it, whiskey and fresh lemon... And I leave out the sweetener because I'm fine with it. And then a little bit of ginger and nutmeg. And it is so delightful. Oh, oh nice. and a lot of a lot of sparkling water. A lot. I'm a fan of sparkles. hmm Me too. So today, since it is Pride Month, we thought that we'd kind of do a check-in on me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I thought on that you. we would. <laughs> and what's been going on with me is I've been trying to get more comfortable with claiming my sexual orientation and how I identify. And especially with the added layer of working through trauma that I've experienced both from a really young age and at multiple formative periods in my life, which makes me feel really insecure and uncertain and accepting this part of myself, which is not a great way to feel. Right. But that's been through the pandemic. And I know some of you listeners have written in about this, of having these questions. And, and for me, this has been a time of being really mindful And I have done a lot of work through therapy and trying to figure out these pieces of myself and why I react in certain ways. So a lot of that work has been done and I continue to do, but I still have like a real insecurity around all of this. And another thing is I have experienced pain because of how I identify, but most of it was confusion and trying to fit in and feeling wrong or othered, which is something I could do and did easily do, but it's also something I could hide and compensate for. So I don't feel great about claiming the queer label, even though I'm positive I am. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's like that feeling of you haven't suffered enough, which is kind of a messed up way to think. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people can connect to feeling feeling like that. At the same time, uh, maybe I haven't been open enough about it when it's really nobody's business, but at the same time, I feel like I should be visible to help destigmatize and hopefully provide an example to someone younger who is struggling. And I have felt experience of being erased even from within the LGBTQ plus community. And that's been painful. I don't think I even knew how to put it into words before where you'd have this moment of like, oh. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. And, and in case anyone's listening to this and is like, what, what are you talking about? I So through the process of being on the show, this show has really helped me like learn words about how people identify. And that's how I went on this journey. And I've been pretty open about it on the show that I uh, identify as ace or perhaps demisexual. I'm still working through that because I don't have a lot of experience with that, which I'm going to talk about more later. Right. But you're not the only one. And we've heard from so many listeners how this this resonates, whether they are identifying as bisexual and feeling erased, because there's a lot of erasure within that community, as well as ace, not understanding what that was and, and trying to figure that out for yourself. And then the subcategories within being ace. There's a lot to yeah. it. Uh, I'm still trying to learn it. You give me new things to learn. And I think it's beautiful as you learn for yourself who you are and how you feel and how you're growing. And it changes. It can change. And that's okay too. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, listeners, I know we say it all the time, but it has been so rewarding and validating to hear from you all um, mm-hmm. wherever you are in this process of learning about yourself and how you identify it really has been quite a moving and powerful experience for me. So thank you. 
thank you, thank you for being open with that and sharing that with us. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the big things I've felt through this is it's it has put a lot of things in my past in perspective. Certainly my desperation to fit in, to want to want to have sex, mm -hmm. my willingness to settle down to make my parents happy, which now I'm like, what? they would never want that for you. Why were right. you thinking that was a thing you should do? And yeah, none of that was really about what I wanted. Not really, at least. Or is what I thought I wished I wanted at best. I know this gets really confusing, but there's a very strong... For a long time, there has been a very strong wish to be quote-unquote normal right. and to want those things. Right. And I think that's been really painful too with this whole trauma aspect is it makes me doubt. I feel like I can't separate those things, but the more I've thought about it, the more I feel like it's twofold. Like you can... I went through these traumatic experiences that, yes, did mess up like trust and my views on sex. But that can be true and it can also be asexual. And so it's like a two trauma kind of situation instead of one or the other, which is how I was kind of framing it before. Where I couldn't know for sure, do you not want to have sex because you're asexual? Or do you not want to have sex because you have all these bad experiences from such a young age with sex? But I remember that even like my first traumatic experience was at four, but even like around that time, this sounds terrible, but that memory, like the traumatic thing, it, it was very traumatic. But what really messed me up more was that we moved like that around that time. That's just how my kid brain was like, oh, I'm losing all my friends. But this guy is like kid who was my age, tried to kiss me at a birthday party. And I remember being like, I don't like this. I don't want this. Why is this mm -hmm. happening? So I think for me, even a pretty young age, I was like, no, not into it. Um, of not course, as a child, you you do change from those ancients. But I, not my thing. Yeah. Go away. Yep. And I remember him saying, but I might not ever get a chance to. And I was like, well, that's too bad. <laughs> not into it. And yeah, they think... This whole thing of, I feel like I'm not able to put myself first, and that's been a problem, and that makes me afraid of myself and not standing up for myself and what I want. So not being in a relationship, even if I do want some form of relationship, is just safer because mm -hmm. I'm afraid I'll just go along with what the other person wants. And it is all, it's sad when I hear people say things like someone who is asexual is just someone who can't find anyone willing to have sex with them, which I have heard. Mm. So they just say they're asexual. And another thing I've, I've been thinking about recently is how messed up it is that I don't want to attract anybody, <laughs> but a part of me still associates my value with being attractive mm -hmm. and specifically men wanting to have sex with me. So I feel like I have to have the body and attract people even though it's not a thing that I want. <laughs> and yeah, I get... I, I hate this too, but I get embarrassed for past exes having to explain to people that I don't want to have sex which is something I shouldn't even worry about, but I do. Right. Of just like, you know, that kind of dude thing of like, have you have you hit it yet? <laughs> and it's like, nope, she's still holding out and all that kind of, that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And then also I've been thinking about this entertainment wise, because of course I have. I like it when characters don't end up with anybody or it's not a focus. So I like that Luke Skywalker didn't end up with anyone, that Ray didn't end up with anyone. So when we have conversations of who they should end up with, I'm always kind of like, did I have to end up with anybody? Right. And I get that I'm a like super minority in this, but it is nice to see. And I think there is this sort of background thing too, of if you look at like our Sharon Carter episode, for example, there has to be romance with Steve Rogers with a woman. Or people might start questioning his sexuality. Wouldn't that be terrible? Oh my God. He can't be this big, strong hero and be gay or ace or what have you. Or there can even be a doubt about that. Yeah. So there are kind of jokes about it throughout those movies that he hasn't kissed someone in so long, that he might be a virgin, that he needs to be set up with somebody, which isn't bad necessarily. It just feels like in general, there has to be some level of usually heterosexual romance or something is wrong with that character. <laughs> but at the same time, <laughs> they're fictional characters and I want them to be happy. So if they want someone, then I want them to find the very best person for them. <laughs> <laughs> it's a strange place to be, Samantha. <laughs> it's an interesting place to be. I guess I've never really thought through that deeply. <laughs> 
I do have the moments of like, this is really forced and it's unnecessary. Let's not do this. Mm-hmm. Um, this is absolutely clickbaity, I guess, for the lack of better terms. And this right. is definitely sensationalism. And so mm-hmm. it's unnecessary. I think with any trope, it's kind of that level of why do they pair the only gay people? They obviously have to be together instead of just right. being friends. Why can't we just leave them be? Mm-hmm. Why does the main lead have to be with someone immediately? And if they're alone, like the sidekick is alone, that's sad, so let's give them a dumpy chick to make them right. feel better. You know, like yeah. it's, it's, so, it's so unnecessary. So it's definitely right. this ingrained thing that if you're alone, that means you're sad and pathetic. And right. that's just... uh. Uh, again, I, you and I talked about this where we were like, oh, maybe we're just not normal. When we were right. like, no, I, I'm actually happier single most of the time. And the only reason I would be in a relationship is because it's worth it. Mm-hmm. If I'm in this just because I'm just in this, I'm not. No, I've, I've seen right. that I can handle being alone. And I like being alone. And I like the freedoms of being alone. So knowing that I could do that. Why would I put myself through misery because I'm afraid to be alone? It's just that, right. that's the whole level, but that's beyond just sexuality. That's just that level of security. But again, yes, you if you're trying to prove yourself as something that's considered for the longest time shameful, which is mm-hmm. so sad to be closeted in any way, then yeah, that's a whole other layer that definitely I don't understand. Like as as a cis female, I don't quite get that completely but i can imagine oh, yeah that's that's a whole level that i won't have to deal with or i don't currently deal with who knows things may change that i do find the fact that if i'm no longer with my partner that i find a, a woman to be a person i want to be with then mm-hmm. that's going to be wonderful and i'll talk about my identity there but today as as we're speaking you know what right. it is but i do really appreciate and maybe because, again, I'm right at that line. I'm apparently geriatric millennial, which, by the way, <laughs> whoever did that, whoever invented that term, because I'm very angry about that, f- you. Uh-huh. But but like the whole level of the fact that I come right between the Gen X and millennial, I was born in 1980. Like, people coming out in my generation was still newer and was still a novelty. And don't mm-hmm. get me wrong, it's not easy is still the LGBTQ plus community, they're marginalized for a reason. They, they are a community that still has to stand up for their rights. The fact that they have to continually defend who they are to the government and being acknowledged as people in mm-hmm. general with basic human rights is beyond infuriating and just heartbreaking. But it's really beautiful to see as the younger generations come, and I'm talking about like, kids that are just now graduating college, that's just now going to college, that's getting into the workforce, being able to be like, I'm bi, I'm pan, I'm all these things. I'm just fluid because I want to love who I want to love. And I'm like, I love that. And that's become Mm -hmm. a little more normalized. And I I love to see it. Like, I'm trying to still wrap my head around what that is, but I I love it. It's such a, like, if it wasn't aura, it's like bright pink and yellow and purple. I'm like, yay, (laughs) it gives me such a a kind feeling, like in the field, in the sun, where there's no bugs and no humidity. And I'm just basking in that (laughs) beautiful moment that this is. But we can't ignore the level of still hypocrisy within even the marginalized communities. We know as you were talking about trying to figure yourself out and being invalidated because maybe some people have not had a relationship with the same sex as they're like, that means means you're not bi. Well, that's not true. That's Mm -hmm. not true. As well as people who are married to like, a man, if a woman is married to a man saying that you're not bi, that's not true. Or if you're uh, with a woman or with the same sex that you're not, you're, you're just gay and you're not this. It's, it's so sad to see that dismissed in general in any way. But Hollywood's narrative does not help when they no. trivialize it or make it clickbait or make it, yeah, all of these things that you're like, uh, why did you do this? Yeah, yeah. And it's it's one of those things where I've been very privileged in a lot of ways, but I was kind of like, similarly, Samantha, I was like, oh, I'm so invigorated by seeing more and more young people be open about it. We're having more conversations about it. And then you'll have kind of this moment of like, oh, reality check. We still don't have like a gay couple in these big, you know, franchises. Right. They're just not there. And because the company in question is afraid of backlash or they, Mm -hmm. you know, are trying to protect themselves. But at the same time, they want to give like hints where, see, we're cool, you know, it's there, if you squint. (laughs) Right, right. If you imagine it, 
We're going to put you again, in like this canon. This is why I love fan fiction. It is there. <laughs> <laughs> it's your, your ace romance abounds in fan fiction. One thing I have been dealing with that I'm kind of surprised at is jealousy. And I'm not a natural, I don't really get jealous. But I, I have been finding myself, I get jealous with people who just know how they identify and feel confident in themselves. I'm jealous of that. I don't get lonely. That's not really a problem I have. But I do feel like that's a problem with me. Like I should get lonely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I know it's not, but it is a hard thing to shake. And I do get fleeting moments of jealousy when I see people happy together. Um, I'm happy for them, but I'm also jealous. I think that's just normal. Right. But it's just odd. Like, I haven't really experienced that before. And I, it's just this whole, like, yeah, not trusting myself or other people. And that kind of sucks. Right. That kind of sucks. <laughs> right. And then I do get, like, one thing of some of my friends, I've started asking them questions like, what is it like yeah. um, <laughs> to, to feel this, like, overwhelming attraction to someone? And I, I think Hollywood has been a big part of that for me as well, of, of like, I get jealous of what I see in the movies, of, like, right. your heart stops and you, you just you feel flush and your, your stomach flutters. And these are things that I've felt, but it's not... I don't know. I think that the the narrative of, you know, your one true love is beautiful, but it's also been damaging. <laughs> right. Well, again, I'm with you with that. Because even just recently, watching The Conjuring, you know, <laughs> the Warrens being painted as this connected, spiritually connected, emotionally right. connected people that they can just connect to each other in such a way and everything's about each other and, and bringing each other for a purpose. And I'm like, that's cute. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, yeah. what, and, and I guess maybe I'm just a cynic because we have seen amazing couples. And when I yes. see amazing couples, it floors me. I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. wow, that that exists. But again, yeah, part of that is the Fed lie that this you have to have the perfect blah, blah, blah. Right. And if you don't have the perfect blah, 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 then it's not working, get out. So right. instead of realizing this is about a lot of work, it, relationships in general, like friendships, are a lot of work. You have to maintain things. But for such a long time, it's like, if it's not an easy fit, then why would you be there? Right. Again, I said like previously when I said, you know, I'm happy alone, that's fine. If it's not good for us, it's not. I'm not saying that there's not hard times. That I'm not yeah. saying you're, you can't work through things. You have to work through things. Right. But it, you need to know that it's a value to work through things. Those two right. levels. And I think I feel the same way about like, when I, I was so confused um, because I truly never said I love you to anyone romantically until recently. And again, I'm in my 40s that I have not had my share of like a lot of relationships. It's so foreign to me to stay with someone for long periods of time. Like it still does not register. Mm -hmm. So marriage does not register in my head. At 40 years old, I'm still like, no, I'm good. Right. <laughs> marriage, no, why? Why would I do that? Why would I get married other than you need insurance? Great, then we'll talk about that. Right. That's the only reason in my mind. Again, beautiful couples. We know beautiful couples yeah. who are married and happy. But all of that to say, it just doesn't register. And so I started asking a lot of my friends, I think this was like three years ago, mm -hmm. four years ago, maybe five years ago, when they told me they loved someone, I was like, you did? Mm -hmm. Okay, why? How? Mm -hmm. explain and they couldn't they mm -hmm. couldn't other than you just know or it's just worth your but right and then they would come back and be like that was wrong that wasn't love and i'm like uh, uh oh <laughs> and apparently i had caught when i asked them that question oh yeah it brought a spotlight <laughs> oh, no. and i didn't mean to <laughs> right but it is it's like one of those things that just doesn't completely register and, and you might be right it might be something between both of us having to go through our trauma that yeah. we understand familial love, we understand friendship love, but it's romantic love because yeah. romance is associated with sex, it's associated with abuse, it's associated with yep. manipulation to mm -hmm. us. So there's yeah. this, ah, so many lingering things. Yeah, yeah. And I definitely, I definitely do want to say I have seen couples that I believe feel this this thing, but I think we don't see the hard work in, in um, this thing being like the right. one true love, but we don't see the hard work aspects. So... Mm -hmm. Which makes sense. It's entertainment. But that kind of paints it in a way that makes it feel impossible sometimes. But also, right. yeah, yeah. Um, there's just not that much representation otherwise 
when it comes to romance and especially, yes, to healthy relationships that don't have a sex component. And I know we talked about that in our episode about does is sex required for love, which it isn't, but that's how I felt. That's what I thought mm-hmm. that you had to have that part of it. And I, I will say I occasionally do get really horny and I try to convince myself I want to have sex, which isn't healthy. It feels very self-destructive. Like I'm just going to pull the trigger and do this. Um, And it feels like rejecting a part of myself. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, when I feel this with someone I am emotionally romantically attracted to, it makes me think I might be demisexual. That's only happened like twice though. And I can't, it was so long ago that I don't know. I can't say for sure. (laughs) But yeah, it's not consistent at all. Sometimes I have a strong emotional bond with someone and I don't feel any sort of sexual attraction. Usually I feel something like almost a affectionate attraction. Mm. Like I love every part of you but it's not really physical. It doesn't, right. I'm not explaining it well, but essentially like, it's not like I'm like, oh, you're so hot. I'm like, I love this about, I love every piece of you or something. <laughs> like I want to know all your freckles. I mean, that's that depth of like friendship to me that I, I'm like, I look at you and I'm thinking that you're the, one of the most beautiful people in the world that I just cannot believe, you know, you're in my yeah. life, but I don't want to have sex with you. I don't right. necessarily want to kiss you, but I want you to be present. And I, I'm very joyful that you are there. Right. Well, that's actually a good segue into something else I've noticed. <laughs> yeah, because I do want companionships. And sometimes I get overwhelmed with love for somebody, usually a female friend, and I think we should just get married or settle down or the friend equivalent. And if they want to have sex, I would do that for them because I love and trust them. And I want to give that to them. Only women, never for men have I thought this. But what does that say? <laughs> I think that makes sense. I think it's just, yeah, it's just, you know, it's un, it doesn't have the same level of trauma over it. Mm-hmm. And it feels much more of like an act of friendship, which again, right. we should, sex doesn't have to be romantic. Right. It's hard for me to even think that, even though I truly do believe it. But it's just so counterintuitive to every, like every piece of media I've ever consumed. <laughs> Right. Well, yeah, sex has become dirty and a, or a power. And we, we know this as they are, and I say the overall they, the patriarchy in general, want to maintain control over the female anatomy. So if female anatomy and pleasure means that it disqualifies men, oh my God, mm-hmm. hell no. So that's definitely not going to be something that's talked about. But beyond that, like that sex is for babies. And that's it. Like, that's what we know. That's what we've been taught. That's what we've been sold for, essentially, for years and years. And it's kind of still, that kind of level is a whole different maintain of understanding what sex was. And I don't even know. Do you know the origins where being talked about love came from? Because for the longest time, it never was about love. It was all about ownership and unity. When I say unity, ownership of women's bodies and saying claiming them as theirs. Right. So that's, I mean, it's still fairly a new concept. So we can't get beyond sex, pleasure, love to equate sex and pleasure. So that means pleasure and sex is power. Someone has power who has, you know, all of these things. Mm -hmm. It's such an intricate uh, level of like understanding. Sex is just nice. (laughs) And it's just kind of like, hey, hugs. You know, of course, there's a lot more things to it. We know that there's a conversation about this and this level of intimacy and trust. But yeah, sometimes the only people you trust are those you're closest to, and that might be your friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? What does it mean? Well, yeah, that's actually a good place to end because basically I'm still working through stuff and I have a lot of questions. (laughs) But (laughs) not the only one. But yeah, and I have made a lot of progress, I think, um, ever since we first started this journey for me a couple years ago. And that's been heartening for me. And it's, again, hearing from you listeners has just been so wonderful and validating and comforting and just beautiful. So thank you, listeners, for writing into us. If you would like to send us uh, even more messages, you can. Our email is stuff at iheartmedia.com. You can find us on Instagram at Steph Never Told You or on Twitter at Momstuff Podcast. Thanks as always to our super producer, Christina. Thank you. And thanks to you for listening. Steph Never Told You is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs> 